Hi there, and welcome to the Praying Christian Women podcast. I'm Jamie Hampton, and I am here today with Sunday Burquest, aka Grit Girl. I love that. Her tenacity, <laughs> along with her trust in the Lord, has empowered her to fight through some of life's biggest challenges. In April of 2012, Sunday was diagnosed with breast cancer. In 2016, just after being cancer-free, she auditioned for and appeared on Survivor, Millennials versus Gen X, which I can't wait to talk a little bit about. Um, she's an author, she's a motivational speaker, she's in full-time ministry, and most recently, she has begun a second battle with cancer, and she's here today to share her story of hope, of faith, and grit. So Sunday, thank you so much for being here on the podcast. Oh, thank you, Jamie. I'm excited to be here. Well, I actually, so we get every once in a while, we have um, questions that we get from our listeners and we'll do an episode where we address the questions. And there's one that I think would be perfect for today to just kind of be the theme and the under, you know, the, the undercurrent of what we talk about today. And it's from Natalia who says, as a cancer survivor, I would appreciate it if you would pray about my health and those who are going through the battle. Not really a question, but it's good to address the nearness of God throughout the journey of cancer patients and their families. And I just think that you're the perfect person for this because that's what you're here to talk about is just how God has played a role in your journey and continues to do so. So before we get into your story, though, we always ask a just for fun question to our um, our. Uh, guests that come on the podcast. So what is your favorite prayer closet? Where do you like to go to be close to God? And it could be an actual closet or it could be something totally off the wall. I would say I have a big comfy chair in the living room that I like to sit in early in the morning before anybody else is up in the house with my headphones and worship music and my cup of coffee and my cat in my lap. Nice. <laughs> That's my favorite spot. Mm -hmm. So you've also asked, our, you've, you've answered our second just for fun question, which is coffee or tea. Oh. So you're, <laughs> yeah. you're a coffee girl. I'm a coffee, I'm a coffee girl. <laughs> so I have a funny story. I went to make my coffee today um, before coming up here and my daughter is on Zoom with her class right now. And so, and she was participating, so I couldn't make coffee because it's kind of loud because I have an espresso maker. <laughs> so oh. today I'm a water girl. So if I'm a little off, you'll know why. I'm, I haven't had coffee today. Oh boy. I yeah. don't know how you're surviving so far. Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I would just love, there are a lot of different facets to your story. So I would love it if, um, I mean, I want to zero in on what God's doing right now because I know that's what's really on your heart. But our listeners definitely would probably need some background. So um, could I guess we could just go back in, um, you know, 2012 is when you had your first breast cancer diagnosis. And um, were you at that point, did you have a strong faith going into that? Were you already kind of good with God and kind of had, had that foundation? Uh, yes, absolutely. I grew up in a Christian home and uh, my battle with breast cancer wasn't the first big battle that I had faced. Um, there's been a lot of things like everybody. I, I don't like to list them because I feel like it sounds like, oh, I've been through so much more than others and we've all been through hard things. Um, but most importantly, a year before I got diagnosed with breast cancer, my husband almost died twice. And he had emergency open heart surgery and then almost bled to, le to death a couple weeks mm -hmm. later. So I had already just very recently walked through a major health crisis in our family. It never makes it easier, but it was kind of like, all right, here we go again. You know, we're going to just trust God again. He was faithful with my husband's life, and I know that he'll be faithful with mine. Um, the hardest part for me was my kids mm -hmm. and having to put them through another really difficult situation. And at the time when I got diagnosed, they were 12, 14, 16, and 18. And um, when I first got that call, you know, to tell me that I was had breast cancer, one of the first things I told my husband is, we're not telling the kids. We're, we're just not going to tell them. 
Um, and he's like, well, I think they'll notice you're in the hospital. And I said, you know what? I go on a lot of mission trips. We'll just say I'm on a mission trip. I mean, I knew I couldn't do that, but I just wanted so badly to shield them oh, yeah. from, you know, having to go through this again. It was really hard with their dad. And, um, but I will say on this side of it, that no one will ever, ever convince my four kids that God wasn't there for us and that God isn't good. So that's the um, positive that I take out of them having to live through both of those situations. So um, well, and definitely I was, would into it with faith. Yeah. And I was going to ask you just because I did, I wasn't sure of the timeline with your husband, but I, I had heard that you had had another large health event with your husband. And my question about just now that you're, you know, you're facing cancer for the second time, does it grow your faith or do you get to the point? Um, how are you personally feeling now having gone through not just what you've told us, but I know there are other things too. Um, do you feel personally like these trials build your faith and you just can stand on what God has already done? Does it feel exhausting? Like, oh boy, here we go again. Or is it a combination of the both uh, of both of those things? What does that look like for your faith? It's definitely a combination. You know, mm -hmm. James talks about trials, um, stirring up um, faith on the inside of us. And so mm -hmm. I know that I've grown in my faith walk, but that doesn't make it easier day to day. And I always, I try to be real and tell people, you know, today's a hard day, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, I still trust God even when it's a hard day. And so it's definitely a combination. I think that sometimes when we're walking a life of faith, we feel like we need to let everybody know, hey, I'm really in faith. So that means I'm not upset or I'm not having a hard time. But really, just because you're having a hard time doesn't mean you're not in faith. And um, what I've learned really is that the battle is resting on God's promises, because I believe he already won the battle. He won the battle for us. So I don't have to fight to win my battle. I have to fight to trust him and rest in his promises. And those are two different things. That is so good. And isn't that funny? We have to fight to rest. And that's just how we're wired, I think, is we feel like we have to just constantly be going and going. And, you know, I picture the lifeguard trying to pull the person in and they're struggling. And, you know, the verse where God says, cease striving, know that I'm God. And But we have to fight to rest in him sometimes and and fight for that stillness and yeah yeah absolutely and i you know the first time when i had breast cancer one thing that i did learn through that process was you know i really didn't have a fear that i was going to die of breast cancer i felt like there's a lot of research you know my doctor was pretty hopeful i was afraid i wasn't going to do faith right oh, wow. and that sounds funny but it's the enemy he knows where our weaknesses are mm -hmm. so i kept thinking I'm not going to go to church enough. I'm not going to read my Bible enough. I'm not going to do all these things that we think, well, we know do build our faith. But I felt one day this still small voice say, well, let's say that you go to church more than you ever have, and you read your Bible more than you ever have, and you're just a perfect Christian. Do I owe you something? Hmm. And I was like, oh, no, you already gave it to me for free. I'm not earning it. And I feel like that's the trap that sometimes we can fall into when we're walking this faith journey. So many of us are going through, like I've, I've got to earn something mm -hmm. and earning isn't rest. No, that is so true. And I mean, earning is for others. Earning is for people and for that voice inside of ourself that says you're never enough. You know, it's never mm -hmm. that earning. It's never from, never for God. But I think the enemy likes us to think it is, you know, kind of twist yeah. our thoughts and our motivations to make us think we're doing it for God. So. Absolutely. Well, how would you say that when, um, when you went into your first diagnosis and, and then your second diagnosis also, how have the, how has your view of God and your prayer life changed throughout these trials, like a, a before, during, and after, or, you know, like, what are the different ways that your prayer life looks? Are there times when you're on the mountaintop and you're, you know, just standing on 
those truths that you're talking about and then, you know, and, and then what do you do on the times when maybe you're not there and you're struggling? Mm -hmm. What are your, what does that look like and what are your strategies to get, to move forward? Um, well, I'll say pre um, my prayer life. I've had a prayer life. My mom, I was fortunate. My mom is a prayer warrior and taught me at a young age how to pray. In fact, when I was a little girl, she would make me go in my room and she would say, I want you to go in and pray and then come back out and tell me what God told you because oh, prayer is a two-way conversation. And um, I remember coming out and I would say, oh, he said, be nice to my brothers. And she'd say, nope, he said that yesterday. He always says something new. So go back in there and pray again. <laughs> so, um, I learned at a young age that prayer was essential and key to my life. Now, that's not to say I sit and pray for two hours a day. I think, again, we have a, a religious idea sometimes in our mind yes. of what that means. And really, prayer is just kind of communicating with God, whether it's through worship, whether it's just talking to him, whether it's reading the word. There's so many aspects to prayer. Um, so I was I had a decent prayer life, I would say, going into um, any of these battles that I faced. Um, once I, you know got diagnosed the first time, again, I was trying to fall into this trap, like, oh, no, I'm not going to pray enough, but just realizing I had to just be still. And for me, being still is difficult. I am a, a doer. What can I do? How can I, you know, and so it's really a test of my patience and trust in God to just be still and quiet. And that's something that I've really had to work on um, while I'm fighting these battles. Um, a few of my strategies, I would say, are I learned that that it's important for me to know when the enemy strikes in, in the sense that at nighttime when I'm falling asleep or I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm alone with my thoughts, those are the times that I can I can feel that these negative thoughts are coming and I have to stop and say, no, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to go there. Um, my dad died actually at the age of 49 with a rare form of cancer and I'm 49 with a rare form of cancer. Mm. And so sometimes in the middle of the night, you know, you'll get these thoughts. It's like, you're not feeling good. And it's like, well, you'll see your dad. And it's like, nope, I got all of eternity to see my dad. I am not going to see him now. And so, um, what I learned is that if I actually sang and worshiped out loud, with my mouth instead of just humming along that I couldn't think negative thoughts and sing something different at the same exact time. Wow. So I will sing until I get tired and fall asleep because I can't think the negative and worship at the same time. That is so powerful. I have never, I've never thought that I've always known the power of worshiping and worship music, even if it's just playing but I had never thought of that as a weapon against the enemy to speak, you know, and maybe that is part of why the word of God is the sword of the spirit, you know, I mean, obviously it's the word of God, but, but yes. that, that speaking it has power because mm -hmm. that that's what you're hearing. You're not hearing what's going on. That's really, really powerful. Now, does your husband I, like the singing at night? No. <laughs> um, well, I usually go down in the living room by myself. I'm just, I know, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, right at the beginning of this diagnosis, I felt strongly that the Lord said to me, praise is your weapon. Oh, and man. I we know that, but he was specifically saying to me for this battle, this is praise is what your weapon is. Mm -hmm. And it was really, really neat because um, two nights ago, I did not, like I never slept. I, I think I dozed off at 5.30 in the morning. It was a rough night. And what I did is I just put on worship songs that were ministering to me, that were anointed, and I, I could, you know, really um, feel God's presence. Well, I realized last night I got up, you know, to go to the bathroom or something. And in the inside, I was singing these songs, but I didn't even, I was sleeping. Hmm. And so when you put in, you get back out. And so the other powerful thing about putting those worship weapons inside of us is that they come out even when you're sleeping or even when you're not totally thinking about it. Um, and that has totally helped me so much. So my mom was, my mom had dementia and was toward mm -hmm. the end of her life was in a nursing home. And you can really see 
a lot about how sometimes the things that are are sown during the conscious part of life end up kind of coming out. And there were there were some women that would just sing worship songs or say scripture and you know, and I saw with my mom, she just had this gentle spirit, you know, and but it it is, it's like what you're it's kind of a similar thing. What you're putting in during the waking time is is kind of what stays with you throughout. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It, it was a real sign to me to, that I woke myself up singing these exact songs that I had been worshiping two nights earlier. Oh, I love that. I love that. Mm-hmm. Well, I want to detour a little bit into Survivor because I think that's really, um, I, it, your bio says that you were on Survivor in 2016 and that it was shortly after you had gotten the all clear. Is that right? Where they had said, you know, you're done with cancer. You're, you've got a clean bill of health. So was that sort of like a, was that because of that, that you, you wanted to go into survivor was the, was beating cancer at that time? Like, did that launch you forward to want to do survivor or was that just something that you wanted to do anyway? I had always wanted to do it, but I never had the guts to actually go for it. And it was actually about two years after I got my all clear and my son also wants to be on Survivor. And he, my oldest son came to me and he said, mom, you beat cancer. You, sh- we should just do it. Let's just go for it. And we turned in an audition video together. I was also turning 45 and I thought if I'm ever going to do this now is the time to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, that we got a call. It didn't really go anywhere, but then I applied again the next year and that's when I got the call. So it's something I always wanted to do, but the breast cancer definitely gave me um, probably a little bit more courage. And I felt like gave me a story because when they're casting for reality TV, they're always looking for a story. Yeah. And were you able to share some of your story? I just wonder, well, two questions. Were you able to share your story through Survivor? And was it hard being a person of faith in a show like Survivor. It seems like it's pretty cut through. I, my husband and I watched Survivor in the early days and we did not watch your season. I want to find it so I can watch it. But <laughs> was it, was that hard for you? It, it was. Um, I told myself before I went out there that, you know, and this is how I view Survivor. It is a game. And so if I played sorry with my kids and I landed on their spot, sorry, you're off the board. Right. And that is definitely how I view the game. However, I, I probably went about how I did things differently than others did. I was very, um, I wasn't backstabbing when I did my lying. <laughs> I tried to lie in a nice way, if you can say that. Uh, I was... I actually felt like I was playing two different games, to be honest with you. I felt like I was playing Survivor. At the same time, I was playing a game of feeling the responsibility of representing Christ to the best of my ability. And at the time, I was a young adult pastor, and they don't tell you the theme of the show. Well, once I get out there and find out it's millennials versus Gen X, I work full time with millennials, and that's exactly why they put me on the show. Wow. And I, the whole game, I'm thinking all my young adults, my sons in college, their college friends are watching everything I do and everything I say. So it made me play very cautiously. I probably wouldn't play as cautious now, but one thing my husband, I I mean, not a spoiler alert, I didn't win. You would know if I won. Um, But my husband always says it's better you came out with a good reputation than one with a bad one. Yeah. And that is true. But I, I did feel like I was playing two completely different games and um, than others. I, nobody else had to think about how they were, you know, going to represent themselves to young people um, yeah. when they watched the show later. And um, it actually made for, I'm not going to say boring TV, but, you know, in Survivor, they do confessionals and they want you to vent about the other players. And when they would ask me, you know, what do you want to say? Do you have something to say? I would say, yep. And I would sit there for a second and I would go, do I want to hear myself say this on TV later? And almost every time my answer to myself would be, nope. And I'd say, nope, I'm good. Well, it doesn't make for exciting drama, (laughs) but that's okay. I, um, I just did the best of my ability to serve and to be kind. And those were my top two goals. 
um, was to, you know, actually, to be honest, my goal was obviously to win, but secondly, not to be a weird Christian. And um, the reason I say that is in my casting interview with Jeff Probst, the host of the show, we got done with the interview and I said, Jeff, I got to tell you something. And he said, what? And I said, the Christians on this show, they're weird. And he goes, they are weird. Why are they weird? And I go, I don't know, but I'm going to tell you something right now, Jeff. I'm not going to be a weird Christian. <laughs> and um, he kind of gave me one of those looks like, yeah, well, we'll see. And, um, and you know, thankfully my castmates have backed me up and said I was not a weird Christian. And um, that was really, really a big goal of mine was just to represent God the best that I could while I was out there. So do you still have friendships from that time? I would imagine that was a pretty intense time and that you probably still, how many would you say are still pretty close friends? Uh, well, my entire cast is in contact with each other where God oh, knew what he was doing. So um, he put me on a season that is noted for being nice mm -hmm. and having people that respected each other's gameplay and weren't as, you know, cutthroat as some other seasons. Um, but we're all in contact. There's some of us that are, I'm probably really close with about five people from my cast wow. and five, six people. And actually the whole survivor community has rallied behind me like I have never seen before. Um, raising money, doing events to help me, reaching mm -hmm. out. I mean, it's been a really humbling, actually, and very neat to see. But the common denominator I hear from so many of them is, you know, you were so kind, or you're one of the kindest players, or you're always positive. And those are the things that I, you know, want to be known for in a community that isn't on the whole, um, probably, you know, people that are following Christ the way that I do. So that's wonderful. So your yeah. So your goal was met to, to represent Christ in a way that was good and not weird, not turning off people, but like that they saw something different in you. That's really neat. I, I tried. I will tell you, I tried <laughs> and you know, well, and, and that's really neat that you all, so when you say your survivor community, is that like the survivor community at large or just your particular group or all survivor would, contestants? Is there like a yeah. larger? Yeah, there's about 600 players now all together. Wow. And we have a private Facebook group that's only players uh -huh. and we communicate in there and there's podcasts and, you know, events going on all the time. And so the community at large has been so supportive. I mean, I've heard from so many people I haven't even had a chance to ever meet in person yet. And so kind, so kind and so generous and so, so helpful. It's been really amazing. That is really neat. Well, it, so in your bio, I read that you, after Survivor in 2017, you decided to go on a retreat, like a time away with God. And I want to know more about that. What was that about? And I'm, I'm assuming that it was to kind of find direction, like how do I use this platform for your glory? What do you want me to do with this now that I'm done with Survivor? So what did that look like? What, and what were you going into it wanting? Well, I will tell you, I started speaking and I was speaking for about a year and trying to establish, really get my footing on, on what God wanted me to do. But to be honest, I never took the time to actually ask him. Yeah. <laughs> do, ever do that. Just like go out and say, well, I'm sure this is what he wants me to do. And I was getting frustrated because I was, I felt like I was just throwing things at the wall to see what would stick. Mm -hmm. About that time, a woman um, sent me a gift certificate for a solitude retreat, which was totally directed by the Lord because I was so desperate you know at that point it's like okay I give up I need to find out from you what I'm supposed to do instead of keep trying to do it myself mm -hmm. and so I went to this retreat it's no talking and no electronics for I a always weekend. wanted to do one of those was it great <laughs> um it was but I wasn't excited about it when I first looked at it because I was like I've already been without electronics forever you know that's true um, and I'm quite a chatterbox. So I was like, how am I going to survive not talking for a whole weekend? But it actually was really wonderful. And um, I would say day two, about the afternoon, late afternoon, this has never happened to me before. I was walking, they have like a big path in the woods and a huge wooden cross in the woods and, and like private docks out to the lake where you're not by anybody else. And I was out there one afternoon and 
literally instantly, the Holy Spirit gave me everything for Grit Girl. The name, I started, I wrote three quarters of my book that weekend. He gave me oh all the goodness. ideas for <laughs> retreats and conference. I mean, it was like, that's never happened to me before, but it was instant. And it just showed me, you know, when we make a demand and we take time away and we say, okay, God, I really want your direction. He's a good God. He answers his mm -hmm. children. And so it was really an instant thing that he gave me the whole idea for Grit Girl. Now things have, you know, tweaked here and there, but, but for the most part, everything that he told me that weekend is what I'm walking out right now. Wow. So it's pretty amazing. That yeah, I was funny. very thankful. <laughs> well, and it's amazing when we, you know, like you, what you said is very familiar to me as well, where I'll move forward with something and think, well, sure, this is a good thing. I'm sure this is what God wants. And then I'll think, did I ever really, did I ask, <laughs> did I bother <laughs> asking his opinion on it? And it is amazing when we ask, you know, it, it doesn't take, it doesn't take, uh, it doesn't take a whole lot to hear back. And yeah. so when you, um, when you got going on your, so how, what was the time frame between you starting this journey, having your, you know, the publishing your book and speaking and now what was that? Time so frame? I was in ministry for 26 years with my husband prior to going on the show. Right. And we always knew that at some point I would be speaking out on my own um, in some capacity. And so the show was just basically enough of a hook to get that process started. And um, I would say I come off the show, I struggle for about a year, a year into it is when I start Grit Girl. And so that's been since 2017. It's been a slower process than I envisioned. And I think most new ventures are, but I just keep doing my best to follow, you know, what he's put in my heart. and. Um, you know, just reach as many people as I can. And, um, you know, I think that's one reason that I was on the show is it just gave me enough of something to just jump out there. And because people are always looking for a hook and some people could care less that I was on Survivor. And as the further the time goes by, the more people are going to forget. So really, it's really about getting out the message that he gave me. And, um, and really speaking into the lives of women and young women, that's important. Well, and our listeners might not understand the extent, like the the length that you are going to to speak, because right now you're pretty much speaking and doing guest appearances between chemo and even when you're not at 100%. So, I mean, I know that that message is important to you. So what is, if you could just kind of tie up your message in a nutshell for, for our listeners, what is it that God really placed on your heart to share with women? He showed me that, w that women are, that we all have strength and that that strength is from him. It's not our own. And it's just helping women find that confidence to step out in the strength that God already gave them. But the key to me is for them to understand that that strength isn't for their own rights, their own agenda, their own, this is what you owe me, this is what I get, this is who I am. It's so that we can serve our families and our communities. And so it's really about tapping into that God-given grit that's already there, having the confidence to walk it out in your everyday life and using it to serve others. Um, whether that's your family or your community, other women, your job, whatever it is, because we're called to be servants. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, you know, there's a certain agenda out there that's hijacked, you know, tried to hijack um, women's strength. But really, it's not about me being this strong woman. It's about God in me and what that strength is for. And so that is really the message that I'm trying to get out. And also, in that bringing women together because when you're secure in who god created you to be and you have that strength you're not um you're not insecure around other women you're not threatened by other women you're much more willing to grab arms together and we can do so much more together than we can do on our own yeah and then and when we all do kind of come together or um even if one woman has this this um understanding 
of the fact that our power doesn't come from ourselves and that it's even stronger when it comes from God than anything we could muster up in ourselves. I think that trickles down, you know, in, in a leadership way, you know, or a mentorship way or however you want to look at that. I almost wonder, so when you were talking about Survivor and how your season was known for being kinder and not as cutthroat, I just wonder, I, I really believe that you probably had something to do with that. I mean, you were one of the older members that these millennials are looking up to. And, you know, there's so much that even just our presence as Christians can have a big impact, like a, a, a ripple effect or a, um, mm -hmm. you know, trickle down effect of how other people relate to us. The way that we, you know, like the, the harsh word, or I'm sorry, what is it? A kind word turns away anger, but a harsh word stirs up dissent. Like, just those responses to the initial, I don't know. I just, I have a feeling that maybe you had, you know, maybe God used you even in that season of Survivor to set the tone in a way for the other participants. I, I think that he did in the sense that I don't pat myself on the back, but God does give us personalities and, um, you know, gifts and talents that he uses to further his kingdom. And I did have one of our uh, millennial players was talking about how we had a good, you know, a nice season. And she said, I think it was because of, because you were setting a tone of kindness and I'm not, you know, that's just God in me. I'm not taking um, credit, but he used my personality. That, that's how I am in general. And so, you know, I always tell people when you, when you, the Bible says, when you spend time with him, you become more like him, right? And when you spend time in prayer, we become transformed to be like him. So at some point as a Christian, we shouldn't have to get up every morning and be like, Lord, help me be kind, help me be kind, help me. You know, it should be a natural born fruit of our relationship. And I just, I wasn't perfect at it. That's for sure. But I tried. Yeah. Well, can you, can you share about, there's this phrase that God gave you once you had your second diagnosis. Can you, well, just, could you share your story just for the benefit of other women, I think, who are going through similar things or who have friends going through similar things of getting, receiving the second diagnosis and then what God said to you about it? Because I love that. I love what, what you received from him. Um, well, basically for about six or seven months, I was having a problem when I would eat, not every time, but it was, it wasn't a swallowing issue. It would just hurt in my chest and feel like it was a blockage and it just progressively got worse. So I finally went in and within two days had PET scan, MRI, endoscopy, all these things, and was told I had cancer for a second time. By the time I got all those testings and met with my oncologist, he, you know, he said, uh, this cancer is actually in your GI junction, which is at the end of your esophagus. It's very, it's pretty rare. And he said, it's spread to your liver, your lymph nodes and your ovary. You only have one ovary. And he said, it's terminal. It's stage four. And I'm looking at him kind of in disbelief. I'm holding my husband's hand. And it's so weird because I just remember my mask, you know, and I'm like, you can't tell really what a person <laughs> And I, I looked at him and I said, are, are you, are you, are, is there a timeline here? And he said, well, the typical person would maybe, you know, go a year to two years uh, later in my notes that I downloaded from that appointment. He actually wrote two months to two years. And I said to him, well, I'm not typical. And he said, I know you're not. <laughs> and um, he, you know. He interjected that, you know, to be, to be cautious of the temptation to go all over the country and spend all of our money trying to find some sort of a cure that, that may or may not be there. And, and I told him, you know, that wasn't, regardless of how the healing comes to my body, God is my source, whether it's chemo, whatever it is. And um, he looked right at me and he said, you know, we don't sell miracles and I have to give you the science. And I said, well, you know what? God doesn't sell miracles either. And furthermore, I believe in science. I understand what you're saying. But I said, but God is going to use you to bring healing to my body because I believe this is where I'm supposed to be. 
And um, we walked out of that doctor's appointment. And before I got to the elevator, this phrase came to my heart probably stronger than almost anything ever has. And it was the stage has been set. And I knew immediately what I meant, what it meant, because the day I got diagnosed, I'm just a transparent person. So the day I got diagnosed, I went on Facebook, I posted a video for my family and friends. This is the deal. Well, it ended up being watched like 25,000 times. It was posted in People Magazine, Entertainment Weekly, all these places. So then when I get this final diagnosis from my doctor and the Lord says, the stage has been set. I know exactly what he means. He's already exposed my story in a really big way. And I can tell you that there was that temptation right away to say, okay, but if I go out there and say, God's going to give me a miracle and he doesn't, I'm going to look really dumb. And I remember thinking in my mind, well, do you believe this or don't you? It's easy to say when everything's going great. And I was like, no, I believe it. So that's it. So I made a subsequent video about that. I am standing for a miracle and the stage has been set and the stage is set for people to see God's goodness. And that's what it's all about. I believe that everything God does is dual purpose. He's going to bring a miracle and heal me because he loves me. But the bigger purpose is for the people that don't know him to see that he's good. And that is um, what I'm standing on, that they will see. And as I'm taking people through this process, good days and bad days, on the other end, I, I want them to see that, that God's good. And the stage has been set for a miracle. And it's been so amazing to see my survivor community and people that, that don't know the Lord at all have grabbed onto this hashtag and are saying it and speaking it. And so, you know, it, there's power behind that for sure. There is. And I'm just thinking about your doctor and, you know, his response after, you know, after you said what you said to him and, and how that's going to impact him personally. Mm -hmm. Yep. So. Yep. Right. It will for sure. Well, what would you say um, to someone that's listening who right now is either waiting for news about a biopsy or has been diagnosed with cancer and is just fearful, is just afraid, um, and their faith is shaken and they doubt God's goodness? What would, you, what would you say to that woman right now? First, I would say to her, you're normal. It's okay <laughs> All right. to have those thoughts. I think we, we get con condemnation and like, how do I, you know, how dare I don't trust God? That's normal. We have emotions. So first of all, God can take it. If we're like, I don't understand why is this happening? Yeah. But second of all, just getting in that space where you fight for your rest, you're resting in his promises is the most important thing. And that means surrounding yourself with positive people with positive music. In fact, I had a really well-known um, homeopathic doctor give me a prescription when I got breast cancer. And part of his prescription was to belly laugh three times a day. And he actually gave me a list of funny movies and TV shows. Wow. And I will say that when we told, sat the kids down about this second diagnosis, I said to them, listen, we're not walking around this house like we're going to a funeral because we are not. And we're going to have joy and we're going to laugh. Yes, it's going to be hard. So surrounding yourself with positive, the word of God, having it playing in the background or worship music in the background and finding a couple of key people is really important that will stand with you on your stand. It, you know, for me to, to lock arms with someone that thinks I'm dying in two months is not going to do me any good. I lock arms with other believers that are standing together with me. So find some people, a good friend or two that you can call at any time that will pray with you and encourage you. Surround yourself with positive music, funny TV shows, positivity, and just don't allow your thoughts to go to that fearful place. And when they do, because they will, mm -hmm. grab them back right away and say, nope, I'm going to trust God. I am going to trust God because if, if I based God and who he was on my circumstances and my life, he wouldn't be God. Mm -hmm. So regardless of what happens in my life, I know one thing and that is he is good and he loves me. 
And that is not dependent on my life experiences. That is so good. Those are all such good things. Thank you for that. I just feel like that in a nutshell, like that is so powerful to, for, for someone walking through this right now to have those kinds of things. And I love that you said you're normal to start it off yeah. with, because I think as Christians, we want everything to look good. Oh yes, my faith is strong. I'm, you know, I'm always okay. And we want to slap on the happy face so that we don't look like we're weak, but we are, weak. we're humans and that's why we have God. <laughs> so absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I think when we pretend like everything is okay, mm -hmm. the people around us, when they go through something hard, and this is how I feel about my kids, they send it question themselves. Well, right. what's wrong with me? She can handle it. Mm -hmm. There must be no, nothing is wrong with you. I that's why I share when I'm having a hard day. And you know what, God, God's okay with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, one other helpful thing that I think um, you could help us out with is I want to know how can those of us with friends and family members who are going through a cancer diagnosis or an illness, um, how can we help? What are some of the most helpful things people have either done for you or prayed over you? And then what are this, what are some of the things that have not been helpful or maybe even hurtful that people have done or ways that they have not encouraged you or things that they have said or prayed that have discouraged you or, or brought you down? Um, well, I'll start off with a couple of the, the negatives so that we end on a positive because there isn't a whole lot of negative. But I will say um, when I got diagnosed with breast cancer, someone emailed me to make sure that I understood that this, this, the, um, the, what do you call it? The basis for getting breast cancer was unforgiveness. And so that I probably had unforgiveness I needed to deal with because um, wow. that's the root of cancer. Okay. And that was not helpful. No. Um, Someone else told me to just go off sugar for six months and see what happens. Uh, you know, when you get diagnosed, everyone, I shouldn't say everyone, people are so well-meaning, yes. but please don't give advice unless you're asked. Um, that I found is, is helpful or not helpful, giving advice when you're not asked. And secondly, um, this is just a real practical thing, but I learned that so many people want to help. And they'll say often, just let me know what you need. I'm going to tell you the majority of people going through cancer will not let you know, how, no matter how close you are to them, they're not mm -hmm. going to call you and say, I need my kids picked up. I need dinner tonight. I need my house cleaned. They're not going to. Yes. And so a much better way to approach it would be, would you like me to clean your house on Monday or Wednesday? <laughs> would, you like, would you like chicken or beef on Thursday night for dinner? Would you like a gift card for Domino's or Chipotle? And um, in my opinion, the practical things are the most helpful, along with the prayer, of course, that's a given. Jesus did practical things. He fed people. Yeah. He, you know, he did practical things, and that's what a servant is. So practical things and also the prayer and notes. I mean, the cards and the messages I've gotten, I started like Xerox copying and I'm making a book of all the notes people have sent me. Uh -huh. Because in when it's hard in the middle of the night, those are something I can pull out and read. I'm praying for you. I prayed this, even if it's not a Christian, hey, I'm thinking about you. I mean, uh -huh. all the, these people that I know, they're sending me so many positive vibes. And I just say, thank you. I'll take your positive vibes, you know? And, um, you know, just sending a note of encouragement just means a lot. So sending notes of encouragement and practical help, I would say are the biggest. And then, you know, also being cognizant of negativity and positivity. Mm -hmm. So if you can, you know, if you have a person in your life that's negative, either have a frank conversation with them and just tell them, you know, this time in my life, I can't, I really can't afford to entertain negativity. I, I can't afford it right now. Mm -hmm. And most people are very understanding. Most people don't even realize they're being negative. Mm -hmm. And so positivity, encouraging notes and practical help. Um, you know, that those are the things that I found the most helpful for us. Good. Well, thank you for that. I know that's the whole, um, let me know if you need anything that comes off our tongue so easily and that you're so right that, you know, I think about myself, I would never, 
ask. <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not oh, gonna call okay. you and let you know what I need. So that no. for me, that's that's a really good piece of advice there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could you clean my toilet? <laughs> I mean, no. Right. I yeah. What are you gonna do? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, well, I hope you that's have helpful. you have a lot of stuff out there. So I want everyone to know what you have available. So I know you have. A, so there's a GoFundMe. Is that correct? Is it just one? Is there one? Where yes. is that? Yeah. Where's that located? Um, it is. You can Google it. Um, GoFundMe and my name Sunday Burquest. It's on Facebook, but um, actually I need to get it added to my website so people can find it. But if you Google GoFundMe and my name Sunday Burquest, it'll come up for sure. Okay, I'll try to link to that in our notes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And thank you. um, and you have a book that you wrote. I three three quarters of the book was written that weekend. Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. That's totally yeah, amazing. That, yeah, it took me forever to finish it, which is so weird because I did so much of it at one time. But right? um, yeah, it's called Grit Girl Power to Survive, inspired by Grace. And it's about the different. I mentioned there's a lot of different things that I've gone through, and it's kind of how grit. Pay, played a part in my life through all these different stories leading up until breast cancer. So I tried to touch different things because different people are going through different things. However, the principles really come down to the same thing. Yeah. Trusting God. Yeah. Well, where can our listeners find you online and on social media? So they can go to my website, which is um, I am gritgirl.com. It's it's open and running. We're making some changes to it, but you can totally go there. And, and your book is there book also, there. right? I've My book, book is there. there. Yep. Yep. And um, on social media, I have a actually a closed group for women. It's called Grit Girl Tribe with Sunday. I accept anyone, but it's closed so that we can post prayer requests and support each other. And so that's Grit Girl Tribe with Sunday. I, you can also like my Facebook page, which is just Sunday Bird Quest. And Instagram, Sunday Survivor. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. This has been just great getting to meet you and share this conversation with our listeners because I know that what you are going through is something that a lot of people will be just encouraged to see, see how God is working in you. So how can we pray for you today? Uh, today, I would love prayer for my tumor markers to continue to go down. I had a really good report my last appointment. They had gone down from 170 to 80, which my doctor was surprised about. And that's just an indicator of tumor size. So um, you can pray for those markers to get under 40. And just for peace for my kids. I think yeah. those are probably the two biggest things that, that I would want prayer for. All right. I'm going to also pray for Natalia who had shared uh, yes. that she's a, she's a cancer survivor too. So I'll, I'll pray for her as well. All right. Well, thank you. And let's pray. Father God, we just give you thanks for this time. Lord, we thank you that your power is made perfect in weakness. It's such a gift and that when we are weak, then we are strong because we can rely on you. We can rest in you and Christ's power can rest in us. God, we just lift up Sunday to you and thank you for just her passion to share what you're doing in her life, for her honesty, for her encouragement, for her faith. We just pray that you would continue to just pour out your blessings on her. And we do pray that those tumor markers would continue to go down. We give you thanks and praise and glory that they've already started to come down and that her doctor is surprised. And we just continue to pray that he would be just blown away by what you do in her life. We stand with her in our prayers for total, complete healing from cancer in Jesus' name. God, we thank you that you are Jehovah Rapha. You are the almighty God who heals and that all healing comes from you. We pray that you would utilize her doctor's wisdom um, to, to lead her to a place of total healing or supernatural healing, whatever you choose to do, God, we will take it. But we stand with her and just pray that you would continue to surround her with encouragement, with positivity, and people who will pour into her 
who will give her practical help when she needs it, who will see her struggles when she's struggling and, and be there to lift her up when she doesn't have the strength to be the encourager or when she needs to be filled up after pouring out. We continue to pray just for um, her to feel well um, in between her treatments, that you would sustain her body and, um, and just continue to just pour out your peace under her spirit. We lift up her kids to you, God, and just pray that that peace that transcends understanding would guard their hearts and their minds in Christ Jesus, that wherever there is fear in them, God, that it would be overshadowed by your power and your goodness. We pray that they would see you at work in, in Sunday's life and in their, the life of their family in ways where they cannot deny that you are real and their faith would just be rooted in a way that it never could have if they hadn't gone through this difficult time with their mom. And I just pray that you would give them um, just a deep faith and a deep, deep trust in you, Lord, and that you would give their family joy, just that you would pour out the, the fruit of joy in their home, that there would be lots of laughter and, um, and that there would just be just a, a tangible sense of your spirit in their home. God, we lift up Natalia to you. Thank you for her submitting this question and just um, thank you for her healing that you've brought about. We just continue to pray that she would um, that she would be sustained and healed from cancer completely, that you would just um, minister to her spirit, that she would grow in her faith and just continue to be a woman of prayer and, and that you would just bless her and her family also. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Awesome.